Can universities cope with the latest now? Are universities going to be relevant in the future? In a time of dramatic change, when there is a grand competition of powers and ideas, widespread disruption with technologies challenging the human role in future workplace, with social media transforming the way people interact, and existing systems and role models under scrutiny. Presidents from four of the world's best universities weigh in with straightforward answers, frank discussion. World Insights Special, The Future of Universities. A mind enlightened will never become dark again. That's what they say about education, which is always the key. But what kinds of education? It depends on who you ask and what time. The answer could vary tremendously, but that in itself is a wonderful thing, an open question with inclusive answers. That's why I'm coming to Peking University, a campus well known for openness, innovation, and inclusiveness. Even this lake, after a long debate, it is officially called Weiming Lake, meaning no definite name, a lake with all possibilities. Peking University this year is celebrating a 120th anniversary, and that's why we are also here. A hundred years ago, Peking University already became the largest institution of higher learning here in China, thanks to this man. Cai Yuanpei, who is the president of Peking University Zen. Encouraged by academic freedom, he employed an intellectually diverse group, left, right, conservative, liberal, all in this campus. One could almost imagine the enormous amount of debates that is going on right here. Particularly here, this historic courtyard the former residence of the school's president. This evening, another debate is going to take place right here when presidents of some of the most respected universities from around the world will gather and brainstorm about the future of universities. I will see you then. Hello and welcome to our special program, World Inside with Tianwei on CGTN. We are focusing our topic, the future of universities. It is a gigantic one, I know. However, we have a very strong panel today to help us analyze all of the important issues related to that topic. I'm so honored to be joined by presidents from four world-renowned universities. And now, let's meet them. Professor Lin Jianhua, the president of Peking University from China. Professor Stephen Tu, vice chancellor of the University of Cambridge. Professor Louise Richardson, vice chancellor of the University of Oxford. Welcome, Professor. Last but not least, the Professor Peter Sullivan, President of Yale University. Welcome. Good to see you, sir. What a pleasure to have all of you here in Peking University. First of all, I have to say my great appreciation for President Lin for lending to us this beautiful courtyard. You probably have to tell us about this, why we are here. Okay, so this is uh, actually a very special uh, place. It used to be the uh, uh, Yanjing University President House. And uh, uh, very recently, it used to receive the guests, in particular, uh, the uh, international guests like you. And there we go. So my first question, may I have all of you to pick up the writing pad on your right side and try to write down one word. What is going to be the common characteristics 
of this generation of students on your campus. One word, and one word only. Are we ready to show to the camera? Okay, show what you've got. Wow. Diversity, future leaders, motivated they are, ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> I like the word. Yeah, big laughter over there. I'll let you to explain one by one. Let's begin with the ambitious. Oh. Well, I think that our students today are really driven to succeed. In part, that's because they feel a great deal of competition and there's a certain amount of anxiety, I'll be honest, but it's also because they have a deep desire to see the world made better and I'm really inspired by that as a university leader. Mm. Vice Chancellor Richardson, do you agree with your colleague? You have a different word, show it to us. I have a different word, but essentially it's saying very much the same. Um, Cambridge and Oxford recruit very similar types of students, and I think our <laughs> That's a polite way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think our students have to be motivated because it's so difficult to get into these universities. And when they're here, they're motivated to achieve, and as Stephen said, to make the world a better place. Um, they're surrounded by other students who are equally motivated, and that drives them even further. Um, and so it's a wonderful challenge and privilege to uh, be leading a university filled with such motivated students. Absolutely. They are future leaders, aren't they? Uh, yes, they are. They are. What we're trying to do is uh, both provide an education uh, that is flexible, uh, that uh, allows one to learn throughout one's life, uh, but that, that tradition of the university combined with just how motivated and ambitious this generation of students right. Uh, uh, is uh, means that I think we're going to see a lot of a lot of leaders come out of our universities. I see a lot of common characteristics among the three words that you three wrote. But I wonder whether the quality of students has to be more than that, if we are thinking about future leaders. As our world is changing so much, you heard a lot of anger. You heard a lot of talk about disparity. Will students with these quality be able to take care of those issues? Let's go with the ambitious one. <laughs> <laughs> Vice Chancellor too. I think you're absolutely right in identifying some of the real challenges that our students feel. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. I think there are differences in this generation from when I was at university. I think they, our students feel more pressure to try to address what are increasingly obvious disparities in society that you've adverted to. So uh, I think that our students have the raw talent Certainly, I know at Cambridge, Oxford, Yale, Peking, they do have the raw talent. I think they are uh, trying to figure out how, though, they can take what it is that they're learning at university and transforming it into an ability to actually make not just the world better for themselves, but actually make the world better for a wider variety of people. And if I may pull out the word that uh, President Lin used, diversity, is essential in all of that. I think all of our universities have one common phenomenon, which is they, they are increasingly diverse intellectually and from where students are coming, and that's important. People will say, you guys are producing the elites. You're producing the top of the cream, and they're probably disconnected with the rest of the world. Vice Chancellor Richardson? Oh, I don't think so at all. I think you may be right that we are attracting um, elite students, but that doesn't mean they're disconnected. In fact, our students come from every walk of life. Education is the most powerful driver of social mobility that we have. So, so many of our students come from backgrounds very different from the worlds uh, that they will occupy in adult life. Give me an example. I grew up in rural Ireland, one of seven children. Um, and my, some of my brothers today work on assembly lines and, and I got to the position I'm in because education, because I got scholarships uh, to work my way and got scholarships through university. And people are doing this every day. We, have, we all in each of our institutions have many students with extraordinary stories to tell. Immigrants coming into our countries, people from broken families and so on, but they're smart, they're driven, they're ambitious, 
they're future leaders, they're, they're motivated, motivated. <laughs> and uh, they come to university, they uh, acquire, they work extraordinarily hard, and um, they get degrees and they use them. I see. But President Salovey, if we don't see it elsewhere, we do see it in the United States. The anger, for example, reflected in the presidential election and many of the political debates that you have right here. So. What about those students? Would they be able to face up to these challenges and very different views once they got out there into the real world? I think uh, uh, young people in every generation, the 18-year-olds, 18, 19-year-olds, 19 20-year-olds, are often motivated by an idealistic sense of what the world can be. Sometimes that looks like anger. Sometimes that looks more optimistic. You know, it can take different forms. But in that sense, I'm not sure that today's college students are that much different uh, from yesterday's college students. I think the other thing that's important, our students come from far more diverse backgrounds than ever before at all of these universities. And then they're brought together and they influence each other and they are all trying to make their way. You know, the future um, world of work, whatever form it takes, is collaborative. People are going to have to work together. They're, going to have, they're not going to be able to do that working alone. Um, and learning in, in, in university how to, how to collaborate with others, how to work effectively with others, that's part of our challenge in teaching and their challenge in learning. Can that be achieved within the campus? That, of course, is a big question mark over there. But Professor Lian, all of your colleagues have already mentioned your keyword. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, for Peking University, though, in a Chinese university, diversity is still a rare word, yes. shall I say, because usually it, it is all Chinese students, mm -hmm. and usually they are all moving up the ladder through college entrance exam. So what exactly is the diversity you are talking about here? You are right. The uh, pursue the uh, uh, sort of national entrance examination is, uh, is really make people, I mean, alike. So that is also the reason we we'd like to uh, to promote to see the diversity of the of the student. Actually, uh, one for example, the uh, uh, one uh, Chai Yuanpei was the president, and uh, uh, one of the uh, his idea is that uh, graduate from Peking University should not go into any sort of uh, government. Officials, you have to stay as a scholars or do some, I mean, uh, the uh, service. So it's not encouraged to be a bureaucrat right. after graduating from university, but rather to do some grassroots job right. so that they learn through that process. That's right, that's right. Interesting. But, you know, China is changing so fast. Mm. So whether university will be able to provide the tool sets for your students it's also a big question mark. The education program we have is uh, used to be, we had, is, uh, used to be uh, uh, very specialized, uh, but now we are trying to diversify our education program. Take, for example, we have a more, more and more uh, interdisciplinary program. Mm -hmm. uh, we have even uh, some programs only have uh, one student. Really? Yeah. Who is the lucky one? That's quite <laughs> <an> impressive. <laughs> so we, the, the, there's uh, several years we only have one student. What does it say about archaeology, I guess? <laughs> but if I may, I'd like to pick up on something you were just talking about. It seems to me um, that we are trying to educate students to take jobs we can't even imagine today. And so we have to think about, given that we don't know what jobs they'll have, what are the qualities that they're going to need? And it seems to me they're going to have to be very flexible and very adaptable. So we want to equip them with certain basic skills. So the ability to, to think critically, to, to write well, to reason, to act ethically, to engage with others uh, in, a, in an intellectual fashion. These are the skills they're going to need irrespective of what job they have. So I think it's more important than ever that we, we look at the fundamentals precisely because the pace of change is so fast these mm -hmm. days. about 
the fundamentals. There are fundamental changes going on in the world. I know all of you are coming from very different perspectives. Besides being the administrator of a university, you are majoring in chemistry. You are in psychology. Yours is more about the security issue. And yours, if I do remember right, that was about the law, rule of law. So very different perspective. You all know how the world has been dramatically changing. How exactly to your eyes as an educator? And therefore, what sets of skills that your students have to learn now? Are you struggling with providing them with a platform at least they could have access to this information and to these skills? President Salovey. Sure. So I am a psychologist. and. Uh, we urgently need the help of the psychologists <laughs> today. The, uh, the research in my laboratory was about uh, emotions. And uh, our laboratory did some of the fundamental work on the idea of emotional intelligence. Uh, and I, we describe emotional intelligence as a set of skills uh, that uh, individuals can learn. And if they learn them well, uh, they provide them with additional, an additional source of information mm. on which they can make decisions, uh, draw conclusions, uh, motivate uh, creative thinking, uh, 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 solve problems and the like. When I was a student in school, uh, we didn't talk about these things. It's not really uh, uh, a part of the vocabulary, mm. but now it is. Mm. In fact, educational system in Asia is well known for so-called memorizing. Mm and you follow the order and instruction of your teachers. But obviously, tomorrow's world, these skills will be easily replaced by robots or artificial intelligence. The black box will do everything. So what about that dramatic change, the Chinese educational system? Universities included, you have to do right now. Yeah, 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 you're right. I mean, actually, we have a lot of communications, and uh, uh, we, are, we start uh, from the... Uh, uh, specialized education uh, move to more general. Mm -hmm. We have we provide more general courses. We also uh, encourage uh, the student uh, doing more practical uh, activities. Actually, uh, in Peking University, uh, in chemistry, uh, the uh, student now, if you want to graduate from the chemistry major, mm -hmm. you you only need five courses in chemistry so the rest you can you you, mm -hmm. you, you can take the others and uh, but you have to uh, work practical with professors uh, I know uh, there's quite a number of uh, uh, student they involved in this research uh, start from even uh, freshmen so they are very active so you have to identify the issues problems yes. then you could uh, solve those those problems, you have the ability to do that. So that is, the, I think, the, uh, the uh, advantage of the research university, I think. Mm -hmm. Problem-solving capabilities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, according to President Lin, is some of the most important. <coughs> uh, Vice Chancellor Toop, is that what you're thinking? Uh, I'm thinking a very connected idea. I think today, education is much less about just accumulating facts, accumulating knowledge than it has ever been because facts and knowledge are so yeah. widely accessible. So it's, it's critical capacity, being able to analyze and deeply critique the information that is being presented to you. I including think the information coming from the Vice Chancellor of the University. How your students are critiquing <laughs> your information? Absolutely. They have to be able to do that and they have to be encouraged to do that. I would point to another uh, area where I think there's an, a growing need and that's what I would call uh, intercultural fluency. Mm. Uh, more and more uh, graduates of our universities mm. are going to be operating in milieu where they have to work with people in teams and where those teams are going to be increasingly diverse to pick up past words. And that really requires some sensitivity and, frankly, a little bit of knowledge about how other people think. So I would add critical capacity and intercultural fluency. Have you ever participated in some of those events or activities that your students are involved in order to improve these kind of life skills? Absolutely. Give uh, me some examples. Uh, in different this is the time to test whether the university <laughs> president really know what the exactly. students are doing. Uh, so, uh, 
in a past life, I will say <laughs> that uh, <laughs> I have been very directly involved in trying to work with students, uh, in my case, law students, uh, to develop critical capacities through uh, traditions that are about argumentation mm -hmm. and are about testing ideas. I'm deeply involved in moot court competitions, which I think are very relevant to this from a legal perspective. On the intercultural fluency part, um, one of the things that I've always been interested in as a university leader is figuring out how to help students actually find connections across their cultural differences. Uh, I'll, I'll give a very... What is the trick? I think the trick is to try to make, have people feel confident enough that they are not going to be challenged about who they are, mm. they're going to be challenged about the quality of their ideas and their argumentation. So there's a deep respect for where they are coming from mm -hmm. and yet a challenge at what their assumptions are because of where they're Was coming from. Was it easy from. to learn? It's hard. It's really hard, yeah. I think, and, and I think increasingly it's, it's going to be here. important. It's very much in your heart mm. as well as in your head. That's what President uh, uh, Solovey's job should be, is coming from here. <laughs> That's right. What uh, Vice Chancellor Toop is referring to, I think, is the ability to, uh, to empathize, yes. right? to understand why someone else is making the argument that they make, why they make the assumptions they make, how, how you can learn to walk in someone else's uh, shoes, mm -hmm. trying to understand their perspective. And uh, the increased diversity of our campuses actually is one way uh, that students receive that education, right? They learn it from each other. They yes, right, discover yeah. that their roommates mm -hmm. are very different mm -hmm. from themselves. So I would say it doesn't always happen naturally. One of the interesting phenomena is it is possible on campuses for people to cohere mm -hmm. to their own groups. So you actually have to be quite tactical about how to encourage interaction. How are you doing it tactically? A concrete example would be uh, mm -hmm. making sure that you're mixing people in dormitories, making sure that, that if they have for example, ethnically based uh, cohorts, that those cohorts are encouraged and or forced mm -hmm. to have interactions with other cohorts. Mm -hmm. I think you have to think about that really carefully. Well, I'm yeah. trying to recall my university days right now. <laughs> 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 Vice Chancellor uh, Richardson, I have to ask you about that. Security issue, that's your research area. But the world has been changing so much, including with the security issues. And many of the concepts, mechanisms, the way of looking at geopolitics, the way of looking at the bigger security of the world has also been changing, evolving. You have many students come up to you and say, I'm sorry, professor, what you have taught us, out of date. <laughs> See what is going on on the first page? And then, no, they're much too polite to say that. You only have they say it to you. But but actually, actually, it's also not true, uh, precisely because of the, the point Peter was making this. Uh, the, um, the title of, of one of my books was uh, Understanding the Enemy Containing the Threat. Yeah. And the reason I got interested in, in understanding terrorism was because I was baffled by how people who in some parts of their lives could be parents, upstanding parents, teachers, upstanding members of society, and then could join a group which would commit atrocities that violate every known ethical, moral, religious code in pursuit of a goal that the odds are they're not going to achieve. Mm. How do we understand that? So instead of depicting them as one-dimensional bad guys and psychopaths, I thought we would have to understand them. So one of the things I used to do with my students way back in the 1990s, I would um, require them to become an expert in a, in a terrorist group. They would have to read all their literature. They'd get into trouble today probably if they did that <laughs> and so on. Then uh, they would present their, their terrorist group to the class. And it almost never failed that the people who took this class, by and large, were people who wanted to join the military, wanted to be head of the CIA or yeah. the State Department, so no sympathy at all for terrorist groups. Um, they would start by saying, well, all those other groups are terrorist groups, but mine isn't. You know, if you <laughs> understood what, what they have suffered or the experience they've had or their yeah, history, yeah. you wouldn't see them as terrorists. Mm. And that, I think, is critical. It's about trying to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, even somebody who commits atrocities. Mm. I think most uh, governments have responded to terrorism by trying to smash it, mm. rather than trying to figure out 
what's behind it? Where does mm. it come from? Mm. Why the are root people cause supporting these groups? Mm. Exactly. exactly. President Salovey, since the election, I know on university campuses in the United States, enormous amounts of debate about what exactly who we are and why we're here, where are we going. These are all psychological questions, I guess, in a way. But to you, how would you make sure that your university was facilitated students with at least ways to explore answers? Yeah, this is a very good question, and, and uh, universities are in some ways struggling, struggling with uh, trying to make sure that students with very different opinions from each other all have the opportunity to give voice to those opinions, listen to each other's opinions, look for common ground, mm -hmm. debate issues, etc. We notice, uh, you know, what you're getting at in, in some ways are, is, is, a, is a conversation about free expression that is happening on many campuses. And uh, we're very fortunate on our campus. We do have speakers from all mm -hmm. points of view coming and visiting. Mm -hmm. uh, our students do listen. When they protest, they do it in a way that doesn't interfere with the ability of, a, of another student, of a classmate, right. to hear the speaker, if that's what that classmate wants to do. So all of that works pretty well. Yeah. But there still is a challenge. And that challenge is, I think, in, uh, in a different generation, if we disagreed with each other, we would just have it out. We would argue it. We would debate it. We would sit across the dining room table mm -hmm. and over a meal argue with each other. But uh, one of the things I've noticed about the current generation is they have a little bit of an anxiety about doing that. Hmm. They worry about offending each other. They worry about being perceived as a bully if they mm. argue too aggressively. They, if, they, if they believe that their ideas are unpopular, they might be motivated not to share them as easily, mm. uh, particularly if they're at all introverted and it's not a natural thing for them to do. And so universities, I think, have an obligation to create situations where students can learn how to express yeah. themselves clearly and openly uh, and uh, without fear. Was that and difficult? Uh, I think um, we, we're very lucky. Um, our residential college system for our undergraduates, which was modeled on Oxford <laughs> and Cambridge, uh, um, is, uh, is an environment mm -hmm. in which students live for usually all four of their yeah. years with the same students, and they become quite close to them. And that people with very different points of view might find common ground, might find something uh, they that can they, work with they can together. work with, that they yeah. can agree upon. I would like to put the same question to Professor Lin, President Lin as well. Mm. You mentioned several times in our earlier conversation, President Tsai Yuanpei, 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. He is well known for bringing a intellectually diverse right, yeah. university. Left, right, conservative, liberal, even though China don't label people like that in this way, but you know, just put it into plain English. I know you have also been, if I could say it, working very hard to make sure under the current circumstances that would also happen. Uh, I think each country, uh, they have their own situation. And uh, uh, we are, I mean, as a university, we have to operate in this uh, certain uh, circumstances. Right, Yeah. I see. But you know, President Lin, in China, there are so many different kinds of youth because this is a dramatically changing country, as you could imagine. You know, there are those that are ambitious, motivated, want to be the future leader. But there are also those, if you put it into Chinese, uh, those autoku, uh, young people. They want to be in their little world. They want to have a quiet lifestyle, even though they're as brilliant as the students uh, in Peking University. So you see very different diversity how are you working with them? It's very difficult to frame them into one thing. That's right, but, but I, I think we, sh we need to encourage them to be to involved to more uh, social activities, to involve more in interactions, uh, talk to more to the, uh, to the other people, yes. students and the faculty. So that, I mean, we need to, uh, to, to uh, although they, they have different 
characteristics, we need to encourage them to, uh, I mean, to be to involved more okay. to the society. All of you have said beautiful things about how you are trying to change, but I have to say it's not easy. You know better than I do. So where does the guts come from? Where does the courage come from? You know, there's one thing that people know how the world should be like. They know about education. Okay. So how are you facing a reality like this? I just have a fundamental belief that universities are one of the most important social institutions in any country is just tremendously inspiring and as I get to go around and see my colleagues working on every possible issue under the sun and see them trying desperately to discover things to to understand the world better I'm absolutely convinced that we have to keep these institutions strong what is the latest thing that inspired you <laughs> the latest thing that inspired me was a conversation I had with uh, some stem cell scientists wow. who were bringing together uh, physics and biology and uh, without giving away too much because they haven't published yet, okay. <laughs> uh, the idea that uh, actually stem cells operate in changing not only through biological processes but through mechanical processes. Mm -hmm. To me this was a total revelation and that physicists were helping biologists understand the evolution of stem cells. It's not an area I know at all mm -hmm. but as a university president I heard about this and I immediately thought this is potentially transformational. If this is right, mm. it has huge implications right. for how we understand change in the human and in, indeed the whole biome. And so these kinds of things drive you to think this has to be not only protected, but we have to ensure that these yeah. people get to work hard and to discover. I got it in the lights of your eyes and in the crunch of your fists. <laughs> <laughs> it's really exciting. <laughs> it is extremely exciting to think about the, all the technologies and the debate between technologies and ethics as well Absolutely. as we are debating. We just had another debate about how AI is obviously transforming mm. our understanding of what the world is going to look like and, and the deep ethical implications. Absolutely. Bringing together people in industry, bringing together researchers, students who have very strong feelings about these issues mm -hmm. and want to learn more. What about for you, Professor Dean? I go with both sides first <laughs> this time. Okay. Where does the gut come from? I mean, as a reformer, you are well known for being a reformer. You are in some of the key universities in China. You left a track record of being a reformer. Uh, you know, uh, now the technology is, uh, is, uh, is advanced so quickly. Yes. And, uh, Including in chemistry. Right, of <laughs> course, yes. <laughs> so the, uh, uh, I mean, there's not a lot of new technologies, and also there's, uh, I mean, even uh, some technology like AI and uh, data sciences. The uh, the industry uh, doing a very good job, and uh, w sometimes we need to cooperate mm -hmm. very closely to the. Uh, to the to the companies to the industry. Mm. Uh, so uh, a few days uh, we we just talk about the uh, how but and, you know, and the research. That is not that easy to do. Even though you brush it off and say, oh, there's the thing that we need to do, but it's not that easy because if you look at the three other universities, they have learned throughout a long history of development how to build an ecosystem, an ecosystem in which. Uh, schools can work with business institutions and also with the general society. But for Chinese universities, I have to say, throughout history, we are still a campus that is quite enclosed <laughs> rather than incorporating with different factors of society. We're picking it up right now. But this is a process. And yet, your students, they want the best. They want to learn as fast as possible how to build that ecosystem almost in a way overnight, I would say. It's hard, but uh, we not have tonight. to move. Not yeah, tonight. not Don't tonight. Worry. <laughs> 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 but we we did a lot. For example, we uh, we 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 open up a new space for uh, student uh, 
uh, innovative activities. Entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs. Yeah. Take for example, there's OFO. So that is a group of students actually. Uh, they found that uh, there's a lot of bicycles on campus they are uh, not used. So they are uh, repair those bicycles and sell with the student. Mm. Now they becoming the uh, they become very well known entrepreneurs. Well, yes, right, yeah. and doing very well. What about the guts? Where does that come from? Where does it come from? Yes. I, I think there's a very... Is it easier for a psychologist? Uh, I don't think it's any easier <laughs> for a psychologist, but I think one of the ways to act in a courageous manner, uh, I think, is to stop and ask the question, what is the right thing to do? What is right in this situation? And that sounds a little simplistic, maybe, but often uh, there, is, there, is a right, there is a right way, a moral way, an ethical way, uh, to, to address a, a question. Uh, I'll give you examples, some, some changes that we've made at Yale over the years. So we give far more financial support to students than ever before. For um, students at uh, the median income level in the U.S. or lower who are admitted to Yale, uh, their families pay zero. They pay nothing for, for them to come. And we extended that um, policy uh, to international students as well. So they receive financial support using the same model as um, uh, domestic students. And we made that decision, yes, for pragmatic reasons. We want the very best students, no matter where they're from, to come to Yale. That's clear. Uh, but it was also the right thing to do. We should, we should be able to financially support everyone and in, you know the very first speech I gave when I became president uh, first welcoming speech was in 2013 and it was called uh, Yale and the American Dream and I didn't mean that to be parochial that is it was it's a dream that really applies to people all over the world which is that if given an opportunity like coming to a place like Yale or Oxford or Cambridge or Beda and if you work hard you will be able to um, do something in life uh, that perhaps raises you above the, uh, 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 the way, the manner in which you grew up. We have a role as educators uh, and as leaders of great educational institutions, we have a role uh, and make an obligation happen. to help make it happen. Exactly. I think that's right. What about the gut? <laughs> Where does it come from? Like Stephen, uh, I'm inspired by the quality of the academic work that takes place around me, but also, uh, as President Lin said, by the students. I mean, I've often said that universities are the last bastion of the optimist. Standing <laughs> at a... Uh, repeat it, please. I love it. Universities are the last bastion of the optimist. I mean, there's a lot of quite dispiriting things happening in the world around us, and yet you walk into a graduation ceremony and you're surrounded by smart, ambitious uh, uh, kids. Motivated. Motivated. <laughs> Future leaders who are diversified. And, <laughs> and they're proud parents. And you just think you have to have confidence in the future when you see these kids. Um, so they're the ones who give you the energy uh, to, to carry on and um, you know, to make the difficult decisions that we all have to make. It sounds easy, but you already, when you're talking about it, I have a goosebump in my, on, my, on my arms already, feeling about that moment. Before we go, I do have a final question to ask all the presidents of university to write down your answer, which is, what's going to be the future of universities? If I could, one word, once again. Just one word. Opening. Uh, it has to be an opening. Right. One and network. I think we'll be networked to each other. None <laughs> of us can do any everything. Yes, yes, and you so have to put it together. We will be working together more and more in the future. Uh, right. That's network. an optimist, as you already yeah. said, yeah. and right inclusive. Future. There we go. It seems that all of you are writing in the same logic. Yeah. It has to be opened and everybody open to one another. It's going to be networked with a society among many groups within the university, certainly inclusive as well. And that is going to guarantee a bright future, a bright future <laughs> of the university. There we go. Thank you so much for being with us.
Really, thank you. Appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Thank you.